Hello, and welcome to what is the first ever patron introduction. Now, here is the interesting thing about today's topic. The more I've gone through it, and trust me, I've been going through it a lot since, ever since it was proposed, it, the more I have come across the perspective that, frankly, and this is going to sound a little strange, the Royal Navy actually gets it pretty much right about what they stockpile for World War Two and World War One. However, there is a however here. There is stuff which was argued for by different personalities, which is interesting. And um, as such, I'm going to be looking into it. Sorry. <sighs> Should have done it before, but you know, it's been a funny old day. Also, reorganize the room a bit. So, the criteria used, just in case you fancy doing it yourself. Um, again, I didn't want to be looking back in history and pretending to, uh, um, you know, pretending I'm suddenly there putting in something completely different and suddenly taking someone's role. So, I had to look at who are the potential officers around who are making the cases for various things. And there are a fair number of officers who are worried about Wilson's way becoming the way of the world. There are a fair number of officers who are making the case of various things. So, this made sense to me. Now, I have between 1918 and 1923 to tuck stuff away. So, basically, anything which happens in that five-year period, I can nick. I cannot rewrite the treaties, which is annoying. Trust me, it's really annoying. 1922, Washington Treaty, I could rewrite that so beautifully. Um... And I must have a plausible chance of hiding what I propose or scheme which would get me around the letter of the treaty. So what I'm hiding, I must have a legitimate reason for being able to hide. And I was shamelessly admit one of the ideas I'm using here is very similar to an idea which someone else had. And I wasn't going to be using it, but they mentioned it in my comments. And I thought, well, if I'm having it, and it's not just me, it's also another person's devious mind having the same idea, I it, it should we go with it. So I'm going to. And most of all, I cannot entertain any of us much, so I can't be going, right then, what I need to retain in service is... Every single battle cruiser, or all these things so I need to do commerce protection warfare around the world, or sort of things like that. You know, things I, <coughs> I have to legitimately have a reason to be retaining these things at the time, and I have to be able to make the case for it and make it fit within the criteria and limitations of the treaty. So. Who are my options for senior officers? Well, I would never, ever entertain the idea of being BT. <sighs> Starters, I'd have to take a considerable IQ drop. No, um, without me being that rude. Uh, no, just not my style of BT. And BT really wasn't... BT was very good at short-term politics. Um, he had the, certainly had the image in the dash for it. He wasn't good at long-term politics, so you have to think of someone who is good at long-term politics, who is around in a senior role at this point. Again, I would have loved to join for Ad gone for Admiral Henderson, but at this point, he's a senior commander, junior captain. He's not going to have any ability to do it. I did also consider Roger Keyes, but I picked him last time for solving Malaire. So that gave me a limitation of Jellico or um, Trit. And because as much as I love Jellico, he is far too honest a man. I'm going to go for Twit, who frankly would have done whatever was necessary, but that does affect what I'm going to be picking. So, four inch guns. There are a huge, huge number of them, and I want them all. I want them all. 
I want them all. <laughs> so, there are many, many guns which are preserved. I think both them and the six, pounder, six pounders have some region of sometimes like 500 out of 600 preserved of some types. And some of them have several, several hundred, if not even a low thousands of these guns uh, available. Bill, I, you need them all. You need every single one of them. There is not a single four inch gun you want to do without. And that 50 caliber one, I really, really want. Um, 45 caliber, happy to have you. 40 caliber, you're my friend. I want them all. And I want them now, basically. So, they're going to be gone. And the reason they're going to is small ships. I will need them for flower class, but I use them on flower class in model one. I'll need them for trawlers, for all sorts of things which I might have in a future war. So, I need them. It's just, it's constant. And I'm going to need them. I'm going to need them a lot, and I'm going to need them to, in vast numbers. So their ammunition, the guns themselves, everything, the mountings for them. Because mountings are so difficult to get. Mountings are really, really difficult to get. Okay, so please... Mountings, critical, and the guns. Mountings, guns, and shells. Ren, what else? Two pounder, three pounder, six pounder. Do you notice there's a theme here going on? Basically, big guns change a lot, and they improve. But little guns, which can be crammed all over little ships, yes, there are better ones out. Yes, better ones come along. But honestly... You go with what's available, and you can tremendously... You can, it's almost actually easier to build the small ship than it is to build the guns. As the point is, it takes a long time to produce the guns, and the guns become almost a long lead items for the ships. You can tremendously ramp up your production if you have the guns available, because building guns, is a, especially rifled guns of any caliber, is a very, very precision, labor, skilled labor-intensive project. Whereas building a ship, you... Mm, yes, skilled labour is preferable by a long stretch of imagination. But you can have a percentage of unskilled labour along there. Far more, a greater percentage of unskilled labour employed. That can be trained up far quicker than the people you need to manufacture your guns. Nordenfelt. I know the Nordenfelt ones aren't as good as the Hotchkiss. I do know that. But I still prefer to have them than not. not. And the, that's a hotch kiss on an Elder, Elswick mount. Especially the, also the ammunition. Ammunition. So much ammunition. Need to find a way to store it. So I have ideas for where to store it. And where to store the 4 inch guns and ammunition. So, Twit starts off in Gibraltar. He'll eventually go wander around the world in various other places. As he climbs up the ranks of senior officers. The Royal Navy has numerous naval bases around the world in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, Singapore. Then Royal Navy, their Commonwealth Navy. It's amazing what you can store in those places. There is nothing like the Stark Commission's visitations on places to ensure the treaties are kept. It's just, you know, it's watched, but there's no real sort of visitation program going on. So you could hide quite a lot without even your own treasury and government knowing you had it. And in fact, it's better if your treasury don't know you have it, because then you can order new stuff as well as keeping the old stuff. And that's critical. Right. Mine layers and other vessels under 2,000 tons. Now, that's actually a World War One era marksman class. And what I love is the fact that to make it look like she's still a normal destroyer, they have put up these sort of canvas paravines around which have a look you can see torpedo launchers and these sort of things when actually there are about 70 mines stored behind there it's so cute but the point is okay so your main problem with sloops is the speed limitation well you as only and the torpedoes limitations are done you can remove the torpedo fittings from them and say they're not for torpedo operations you could try to hold their sloop and removing the engine's problems. Or, you could remove the torpedoes from them, leave them with the engine power, 
but rebrand them as Coast Guard for the South African Navy, uh, South African Coast Guard, the Indian Coast Guard, the British Coast Guard. Every single Coast Guard you want suddenly gets a whole formation of destroyers. And this is on the tip of the snout. So pretty much the idea is that if they are kept as Coast Guard ships, you can get around it. And, you know, they're not Navy ships, they're Coast Guard. I think it will be an interesting thing. I have a feeling there would be a little bit of a problem. And, you know, these ships aren't exactly cheap to keep going, but they will be something, and they're also spread out the load around the Commonwealth, and it will provide the Empire and provide the Minions with a little bit more of a, a contingent force. And yes, they might well have to be replaced as the interwar period goes on, so you might end up having more than the built. But actually, in a way, if you can get those nations more used to how pricing ships, and considering how well the US Coast Guard performed in anti summary warfare during the Battle of Atlantic, etc. It could be a very useful thing for increasing the availability of naval escort vessels and having far larger formations nearby for operations. For example, Singapore, etc. If you can get them used to this earlier, they might be more incre they might be more in uh, inclined to burden share. Because let's be honest, half the problem with Singapore was they didn't want to actually pay for their own defence. Well, rather the governor did. The governor wanted to keep catering to everyone making money and forgetting that you actually needed to pay for security. Now, of course, there's no point keeping a whole load of mine layers around if you don't have mines for them. Luckily, the Mark VI mine had been procured in thousands, and not just the ones used on the North Sea barrage, there were some sitting in warehouses anyway, and there were some actually which recovered successfully from the North Sea barrage. Mostly they were minesweeping, they destroyed them. But the thing is, you had a lot of them, and again, keep them around and deploy them around the Empire. Deploy them to places where there are those now Coast Guard vessels ready to use them. Mines, they are very useful for causing a lot of trouble for, annoy for other nations which are trying to get things you want to keep. Exciters. Okay, why keep these? Because if you want to make the case for having better land, for having landing craft, and it's developing an amphibious uh, warfare capability, you really need these. I know it's not technically against the, tra uh, the treaty rules, like mines aren't technically against the treaty rules, but keeping them in large numbers will cause treaty issues because it will encourage others to start investing in amphibious warfare. And if you don't want them to, but you want to do it, you need to come up with another reason for keeping them. And there were a couple of exciters kept anyway, for things like moving stuff around harbours and various naval ports, and I, my proposal is that a fair number more would be kept under such duties. The fact that in an amphibious exercise they might be used for getting some troops to and from ships to shore, and therefore could provide the basis for developing far better landing craft as time goes on, um, it's merely incidental. Right, something is not limited by, something is not limited by treaty, but by domestic politics. Boy, I'm not used to that title. Now, leaving that to domestic politics, what's the issue for the Royal Navy in the UK? It's the loss of the Royal Naval Air Service to the Royal Air Force and the fact that BT actually thinks it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Not everyone did. So, here's the thing. You can't keep land-based aircraft if you're a na Navy and justify them. You also cannot really keep control of the fleet's air arm separately under the way that it's drawn up because you don't really in 1918 
have enough carriers to justify it. They're going to come, they're going to be grown during the interwar period, and you will eventually get them back. But that's not going to call, and that's not going to help you. And your biggest loss actually is your engineering connection to the service, uh, to the engineers. Your engineering connections, basically, and understanding. That's in the PhD thesis, which you can't read here because it's not been not being published yet, but it's going to be. It might be turned into a book as well. Anyway, leaving that to one side, how to get around this? Well, I had a little bit of a thought. The Royal Navy maintains yachts. It maintains all sorts of things for the Admiralty and for admirals on stations. So, the thing is, if you started saying and you know, developing, we want to use some, uh, we're keeping some seaplanes for communication reasons within the Admiralty for various distant stations. Now, I'm sure the RAF would put up a hubaloo, but if you phrase it in that respect, you can keep them. The thing is, if you can keep them and get them in development and keep them in development, okay, it's a bit limiting, but perhaps over time you develop what is in effect a shadow support command, a shadow um, system of providing What is in effect a shadow coastal command? Sorry, I forgot the word coastal there for a second. <laughs> I don't know, it won't be in one of those days. So, you would have to make sure you weren't running them from air bases because if the RAF sees them too closely and sees what you're getting up too closely, um, you would probably have a fight on your hands. But if you could keep them, far enough away and operating in the China China station, probably in several other parts of the Far East, let's be honest, the RAF presence out there is always more in the interwar period orientated around Iraq and the Middle East than is the actual Far East, despite their talking about defending Singapore and various other things with torpedo bombers, the actual wing cow, uh, wing, uh, Cave Brown Cave is the um, you know the high point of RAF presence really in the Far East during the interwar period. Uh, you could also in the South America and you know, various other stations you could well, manage to make a case for having them, for using them, for needing them for communications, and maybe to support reconnaissance and making the case that the Navy wants to do, is doing them because. They have no role to play in the RAF system, in the and in, in the thing. But it's just a few aircraft to support the navy. And if you have enough of them, you can grow them into your own nascent coastal command of a sort of thing, you know, your own shadow nascent coastal command. And I think this would have been a really, really critical thing if they could have managed it because it would have made such a big difference in Model Two. If Coastal Command had not been about what the RAF wanted purely, and they were focusing, of course, on the bombing campaign, as they saw that as the primary way of winning the war against Germany, you can debate that all you want. It was their heartfelt endeavour, and it was what they believed was the case. Okay? But if the Navy had had this, I have a feeling that the Inskip Award with the way the RAF was dealing with the Mar uh, with the Coastal Command, I have a feeling Coastal Command, as long with the Fleet Arm, would have ended up going past the Navy. Which could have an interesting repercussions all to this day, because, you know, the P that would mean the modern P-8 to be part of the Navy and all these sort of things. Um, and frankly, I think the RAF does a good job with the P-8s at the moment. I think they should be joint assets, but that's mainly because I want more of them, and that's the way I see of growing them, making them a joint asset and having two services arguing for them. And actually, you know, doing that. But that's me and my personal view on it. I think in the 19, we can all agree that in without 
causing too much of a furor that in the late 1930s, Coastal Command was definitely a finishing fourth in Air Ministry priorities. The bomber force was number one. Fighter Command was a distant second. The fleet air arm was probably probably a distant third. Maybe actually, maybe actually, Fighter Command was actually behind Fleet Air Arm because at least the Fleet Air Arm had the Admiralty banging on the Air Ministry's door about it. Um, and then there's Coastal Command, which is just way down here, going, oh, "We'd like something, please," because of their order of priorities. Um, so this is my point, you know, if the Royal Navy had managed to keep some seaplanes, it would have worked. Now, again, I said they don't have, they couldn't have airfields, so they would need <sighs> seaplane tenders. Now, HMS Highfly and HMS High and Sumpf actually had a sister ship which was converted into a seaplane tender, but sunk earlier in World War One. Again, they would probably have to have all their guns removed. Which is a good thing, because frankly their guns aren't that much use. But they could they could be converted into seaplane tenders quite easily. Again, you could do this with other old ships which you're getting rid of at the end of World War One, And that could have been a way of A, keeping our ships in service, B, also providing support for those sea, uh, those seaplanes. And it would have been useful. And see, let's be honest, seaplanes would have been useful in our reconnaissance assets in this period. In the interwar period and going into World War II, yes, they would have diluted perhaps the focus on aircraft carriers a little bit, but probably not that much, as their number of aircraft would never be that much, and there was an effort in float planes and seaplanes anyway. And if the Royal Navy had had its own connections, it would have paid off in other ways that would have helped with the transition and the eventual um, inclusion of the fleet air arm in the fleet. It's an idea. It's a domestic politics. And anyway, so. This, of course, is the 6th of July, so it's a Patreon video. Um, what stuff would you put in warehouse at the end of World War 1 for World War 2 if you're in command of Y? I'm looking forward to tonight's topic, because I think it's going to be far more of a discursive one. Far less me talking, far more you putting forward your ideas and me discussing them. I'm looking forward to that. Um, 9th of July, flying boats and seaplanes. There might be a real connection going on here. Flying boats and seaplanes, ooh. I know, some people think I just throw these things together at the last minute. I really do actually think it through. It takes a lot of effort to look this this organised. Um, Tuesday, 4th of July, some more admirals, engineers and historians. I wonder why they were doing a certain group today in terms of super pairs. Hmm. And a naval diplomacy on Thursday, the 16th of July. Ooh, it all starts to move together. And then we have the picture and video. Uh, the CIA, Royal Navy Operations in the Indian Ocean from 1941 to 1943. From the sea, Korea, Indonesia, and Russia, confrontation. Uh, making Mary Nostrum a hollow jest. Well, hey, submarines, I've got some books ordered. Literally ordered today, which will be arriving on the 14th, which will make that spectacular. And then 3rd of July, the pre-tribals. The Irons destroyer force of the interwar period before the great, the wonderful tribal class destroys came into being. All praise for Cossack, Eskimo, and Nubian. All praise Cossack, Eskimo, and Nubian. Sorry. <laughs> but seriously, if anything does it, if any ships could go for sainthood, Cossack, Eskimo, Nubian. Sister of the Holy Regulation Violation, Sister of the Battle, uh, Sister of the Battle Loss, and Sister of I'm in every single fight going. I'll stop being quite so bad. Sorry. Bad jokes. And this is where else to find me. Twitter at AC underscore Naval History. When I'm awake and tweeting. Uh, Patron! Whee! That's where you get a vote. On August's one now. They will be open. They are August options. Have been put forward and I have put them to the vote so August is now open to vote and there are some great ideas there and Global Maritime History which I will be publishing some stuff on again once the book is well the book is all in at least it should be by the time this goes up I mean going through things and checking pictures are in the right order and finding I mislabeled pictures and it was just oh 
they were right, but they just had, I, I spelt Drakens when I was wrong. Anyway, take care. Only in two of them, though. In, all the, in about two dozen others, I got it right. In one or two, I got it wrong. Just one. Anyway, that's all this aside. Thank you very much for subscribing. Thank you very much for watching. And hope to see you later today for more about this exciting topic, which, honestly, I'm pretty jazzed up about. What stuff would you put in Warehouse at the end of World War One for World War Two, and if you're in command, and why? Well, most of the stuff I put in, as you can tell, was put in for the operations of Escort War, Mine Laying, and Reconnaissance, slash, it's nice to have, and keeping far, and building a better connection between the Navy and the aero industry. Hmm. Enjoy. Thank you, and see you later. Literally, it's two seconds to 26 minutes, so I'm going to try and keep this up.